Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Robert Friedman will present, Can We Someday Prevent Schizophrenia Like We Prevent Cleft Palate? The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $360 million to fund more than 5,000 grants to more than 4,000 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, addiction, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Robert Friedman. Dr. Friedman is the chairman in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is a 2015 recipient of the Lieber Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Schizophrenia Research and a two-time Foundation Distinguished Investigator grantee. Dr. Friedman serves on the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Scientific Council and also serves on the Pardis Humanitarian Prize Selection Committee. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Friedman's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I'll present as many of your questions as time will allow. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Friedman. Bob, the floor is yours. Jeff, thank you for having me and for, for inviting me to give this webinar. I am particularly pleased because a lot of this work was made possible by the grants from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, which enabled us to start work that couldn't be started anywhere else. The title of the talk is, Could We Someday Prevent Schizophrenia Like We Prevent Cleft Palate? One of the great success stories of medicine is what we have been able to do with cleft palate. Cleft palate is a, an illness which is like schizophrenia, developmental, comes from both genetic and maternal causes, that is what happens to the mother during pregnancy, and after birth, it's extremely difficult to treat. Many plastic surgeries are required, and in its more severe forms, it becomes spina bifida, where the entire spinal cord does not fuse. The miracle is that if folic acid is added to the mother's diet, in a relatively high dose, in fact an overdose, the cleft palate normally will close even in, the absent, even in the presence of genetic risk factors, and the same is true of the spinal cord. In other words, carrying genetic risk and environmental risk for cleft palate, the baby is still born with a normal face and a normal spinal cord. The folic acid has to be given before birth. If it's given after birth, it's too late. But before birth, it has this miracle action. And so today, around the world, all women receive an overdose of folic acid as part of their prenatal vitamins. This graph shows you the effect of no treatment. In blue, a relative risk factor of one. And the risk is approximately two-thirds less if the woman has a good diet takes all of her multivitamins, and in addition, takes the overdose of folic acid. The question that we have asked is, could something similar be done with schizophrenia? 
After all, schizophrenia also has developmental origins. It's also affected by what happens to the mother during pregnancy. And if there were something similar we could do to prevent schizophrenia, ADHD, and autism, and other mental illnesses, as simple and universal as we do for cleft palate and spina bifida, that would be a great boon to the health of our public. Now, you may think of schizophrenia as something that begins in adulthood, and it's true. It's not until age 18, maybe 17 or 16, early in adulthood, that individuals first begin to show the full symptoms of the illness. But we know that previous to that in adolescence, there's anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, school failure, and individuals who become uh, psychotic do tell us that they have been concealing their hallucinations for some times. And finally, oftentimes the first presentation is a suicide, which is the most tragic way, of course, for an illness to start. If we look back even further, we know that these same children have been reporting attention deficit disorder and social isolation. It's often obvious as soon as they are three and a half or four years old. Their parents note it, they report it to doctors. Sometimes the pediatricians will take action. Sometimes they will say, no, he or she will grow out of it. But, and sometimes children do, but the ones who become mentally ill do not. And finally, if we look back into the fetal and the newborn brain, as we'll see in a moment, there's often a developmental delay. So although we think of schizophrenia as an illness of young adults, it's actually an illness whose origins go all the way back to before birth. If we superimpose this on what's happening to the brain, we see that by birth, all of the nerve cells have been formed and their first connections have already been made. As the child reaches six to eight years old, there's a blossoming of all the connections. And then in teenage years, there's a pruning back so that only that which is most important, I called it pruning to precision, will persist into adult life. And so this evolution of symptoms from fetal developmental delay through ADD and childhood and social isolation to the beginnings of the prodrome of schizophrenia in adolescence to the full symptoms is superimposed on this kind of brain development and the development of other aspects of brain function. And so we think of two developmental illnesses, two developmental models of illness. One is unfolding. Hidden deficits, deficits that have come before birth that do not emerge until the person develops a full brain capacity. There isn't much that an infant can do to show us that it has a mental illness, and that may need the development of the full brain capacity to unfold what all of its problems actually are. Just as talents unfold, so unfortunately does illness unfold across the lifespan. The other possibility is the multiple insult or sometimes called the two or three hit model. Maybe the first hit does occur before birth, but then a second hit during childhood, perhaps a brain injury, perhaps a trauma, uh, perhaps even substance abuse, then becomes devastating. Either way, persons who will develop schizophrenia cannot be identified until they actually have the illness. As I said, we can't identify it in illnesses. And like cleft palate, once you see it, it may be too late to fully prevent it. So we think of three kinds of prevention. The first is primary prevention. Primary prevention means you intervene as soon as possible. In this case, we're going to talk about interventions during fetal brain development before you know that anyone even has the possibility of illness. So examples of primary prevention are folic acid, uh, as we've been discussing, or vaccines. These are things that are given to everybody. We don't wait until there's a risk for someone becoming ill. 
they're safe enough and effective enough that we give them before they're actually needed, before the illness itself can even start. Then there's secondary prevention. That would be intervention in adolescence, when the first signs of schizophrenia are just being shown. Uh, and there is extensive work that is supported by the NARSTAD Brain Behavior Research Foundation program in this kind of intervention. Also important, uh, and other speakers throughout the year have been speaking to you about the promise of secondary prevention. But these are people who are already beginning to show the signs of illness. So these are kids who are already sick, who are being targeted with secondary prevention. And finally, there's tertiary prevention. That's getting in after the illness has already fully appeared and trying to see what you can do to improve the course. So one of you sent in a question about treatment of the first episode of schizophrenia. So the first episode of schizophrenia, as I've tried to say, is fairly far down the developmental line. And it's important to treat it as well as possible. And that's a topic for tertiary prevention. And there's also active research, which other investigators will be talking to you about, that talks about the enhanced early treatment of first and second episodes. But for this particular webinar, we're going to concentrate on primary prevention prevention before the disease process has even had a chance to start. So what is our model? It has to be universal treatment directed to the whole population. And again, we've been talking about folic acid because it's also directed against a developmental injury and it's also uh, a universal treatment that is safe and effective for everyone. What are the obstacles? First. Intervention has to be relatively simple, it has to be inexpensive, it has to be safe, and everyone universal, universally has to be willing to accept it. If people are not willing to accept the primary prevention, then it has no chance of succeeding. But there's some special problems that an illness like schizophrenia presents. Since for cleft palate, we can tell the moment the baby's born whether we've been successful or not just by looking at its face. But for schizophrenia, we have to wait two to three decades until the individual is 20 to 30 years old to make sure that they will or will not have the illness. And that's a rather daunting research question, to make an intervention today and not know until uh, the year 2036 or even the year 2046 if you've done the right thing. And also, there's no easy way to think of to start. What kind of intervention would you do? And so we've spent a long time uh, and been supported by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation to begin to think through that problem. It's not a new problem. It's been known for a long time, since 1994, that newborn babies who are destined to become schizophrenia already have some signs of early brain dysfunction. Not enough that it's diagnostic, that we can take a baby and say for sure this baby is going to develop schizophrenia, but if we know the baby will develop schizophrenia later, and we begin to look back to see what those babies look like as babies, they do have some developmental delay. So this is research that was done by taking home movies from the very earliest days of children who were known 25 to 30 years later to have developed schizophrenia and looking back on those home movies to see what the kids looked like. And what they had was some very early problems developing movement, particularly on the left side. They also tended to be more floppy and have less well-developed muscle tone. And Elaine Walker in 1994 proposed that if a baby was having this much problem right after its birth, and would later go on to develop schizophrenia, some of or all of the developmental insight, insult must have happened before the baby was born. For many years, there was no way to take advantage of this rather remarkable insight, until a second insight came along from genetic discovery, which is that many of the same genes that we now know will later malfunction in schizophrenia 
are also responsible for the development of the brain before birth. So these genes, which we are now researching to see what they are doing in adult schizophrenia, actually have their maximum role before the baby is born. Because one of the miracles of, of the development of the brain is that it has to be developed from a single cell using the program that's contained in the genes itself, themselves. And so these genes work over time before birth, about 10 times as hard as they'll work after birth, trying to construct a brain that's going to be ready for birth in nine months. We can't look at all the genes at once, but we had a gene clue. People with schizophrenia smoke more heavily than any other group. And when they do this very heavy smoking, they activate a receptor called an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor. And it turns out the gene for that receptor is abnormal in some people with schizophrenia. And so we began to puzzle how we could do better with patients and give them cigarettes. And I included a little quotation from Ellen Sachs in her book, The Center Cannot Hold. And one of the first things she noticed about her mental illness is that being without a pack of cigarettes made her very uneasy. And so we took this clue that the patients themselves gave us and tracked down its biology. Its biology in adult life is shown in the upper left-hand corner. And it involves, let me, uh, it involves these alpha-7 nicotinic receptors. They stay on inhibitory interneurons. When they're activated, uh, they make the interneuron fire faster. It in turn can inhibit other cells called the pyramidal cells that respond to information. And it makes the brain much better focused, much better able to pay attention. And it inhibits some of the noise and extraneous environmental sounds around the patient that sometimes become part of their hallucinations and delusions. So patients are able to accomplish that very temporarily by a cigarette, but if we directly activate these alpha-7 nicotinic receptors with experimental drugs, we can do the same thing even a little bit better. But the key is not in activating this system in adult life, it's looking at it in fetal life. And if we look at it in fetal life, we can see that there are a lot more of the receptors, and they're in a lot more places. They're now all over the pyramidal cells. They're in abundance on the inhibitory interneurons, and they have a much different role in fetal life than they do in adult life. They're working 10 times as hard because they're helping each of these nerve cells mature. And in particular, they're helping this connection between the interneuron and the pyramidal cell mature. And that maturation is never quite complete in people who will develop schizophrenia. And so already these receptors are beginning to fail in their role in the person who as it is at risk for developing schizophrenia. And so by the time the baby is born, it will be born with deficiencies here in this synaptic pathway that no matter what we do in adult life, we will never be able to fully overcome. Now you may notice one other thing if you're into looking at neuronal diagrams, that during adult life there is a cholinergic input that activates alpha-7 nicotinic receptors. God didn't put nicotinic receptors, to my knowledge, although I haven't talked to her directly, to enable cigarette companies to get rich someday. They're there because the tobacco plant has learned to mimic a compound called acetylcholine, and that's why people smoke. The nicotine hijacks some of the brain's own neuronal circuitry. Now, in fetal life, we don't see cholinergic inputs, and in fact, they won't grow in until very shortly before birth even though the receptors form as soon as the first nerve, first skin cell decides it really would rather be a nerve cell. So alpha-7 nicotinic receptors spend most of fetal life 
without their cholinergic innervation. And so we began to ask what activates them. And it turns out that choline itself, not acetylcholine, but choline can activate alpha-7 nicotinic receptors. And choline is found in abundance in the amniotic fluid, which is the mother's waters that surround the baby. So the mother, through her waters and nutrients she puts in her waters, is taking on the role of these cholinergic receptor, these cholinergic synapses that will not form until birth. So what is choline? Where do you get it? First of all, it's a normal ingredient in many foods, but particularly liver, eggs, and red meat. There's almost no time in the human life cycle when you're ever deficient in choline, but pregnant women can be deficient, and about 20 to 30 percent are. And the reason is that tremendous amounts of choline are needed to build the baby. The baby essentially is a bag of choline and water. And so to get all that choline, the mother has to eat a tremendous amount. She can't make enough on her own. And there's some problems. If the mother is stressed or anxious or depressed or even infected with a flu or a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, then she will hold the choline in her own liver instead of giving it to the baby. It's one of the ways the mother protects herself when she's under attack. And unfortunately, at that point, the baby suffers. Also, nicotine, it turns out, inactivates alpha-7 nicotinic receptors. It activates them first, and then it inactivates them, much the same way that people who smoke experience that the first cigarette of the day is OK, but the rest of them don't taste like anything. Well, the baby gets exposed to nicotine all the time if the mother smokes. And that also blocks alpha-7 nicotinic receptor. But the single greatest risk factor is genetic risk, which causes too few alpha-7 nicotinic receptors to be made. And all of these particular problems, both the stress, the anxiety, the depression, and the infection, and the genetic risk, can become overcome in animal models by increasing choline. Now, normally, you don't take choline. There's some reasons for that. It's not metabolized very well, and so it makes people kind of upset in their gut unless they get it through their food. But phosphatidylcholine, which is one form that is also present in food, is available as a natural vitamin. And so there was the possibility that women could simply take extra phosphatidylcholine just the way they take extra folic acid and overcome some of these problems, genetic and non-genetic, that increase the risk for mental illness in her child. So what are we talking about? Let's go to the upper right-hand corner, and you see our fetal pyramidal cell, which is trying to develop itself. And it has its receptors, lots of them, and it gets lots of choline, and these cho this choline activates these receptors, and all is well. So this is a woman with normal nutrition and normal genes. But now we have a woman who may have a genetic deficit and has lost some of her alpha-7 nicotinic receptors, so she doesn't have quite the same number, or in this case, the baby doesn't have quite the same number, and she may also be deficient in choline. Maybe she doesn't eat enough, maybe uh, she's infected or stressed and she's holding it in her own liver, but at any rate, too little gets into her water to reach the baby. And now we have deficiencies in the development of these cells that will be lifelong and will appear later in life as a risk for mental illness. What we'd like to do, since we can't change what happens genetically, is just to make sure that the woman gets more choline than necessary so that she has an extra amount to activate what receptors are available. And it turns out that that works pretty well in animal models. And so we applied to the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute of Mental Health and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and they gave us permission 
to try this in human beings. And so now, a hundred women have taken choline, and uh, they we have entered them into a clinical trial. Now, some women took choline supplements, and some women took a placebo because it was a clinical trial. But in a clinical trial, we need to make sure that no woman is choline deprived. So all women received biweekly visits from an obstetrical nurse to try to make sure that she was always advised on what to eat uh, so that she had plenty of choline in her diet. And the night before we looked at the results, our obstetrical nurse, Julie, swore to me that every woman had taken more than enough choline in her diet. So in the clinical trial, the dietary advice went to all women, but half received the choline supplements and half placebo. And then we began to look at the baby's brain development at birth and throughout childhood. Now, babies don't do a lot. And so we can't talk to them about their hallucinations and their delusions or how they feel about other people or how they pay attention. Uh, but they do a good job of one thing, and it's called sleeping. And their mothers are pretty good at putting them to sleep almost any time. And they sleep in a very primitive form of, of immature form of, of dreaming sleep and we can record their brain activity. So one of you already emailed in to ask what an evoked potential is. This is what it is. It's recorded from electrodes that are pasted on the baby's skull. The critical one is way up here. Uh, babies also don't have much hair, so that makes it pretty easy. And the baby simply hears two sounds, click, click. Now, if the baby is the baby of a psychotic mother and is at genetic risk for later psychosis in its own life, already at birth, it's responding to both clicks. Click, click, and we see large potentials. Um, this means that the baby is already having problems in that inhibitory neuronal pathway that I showed you earlier. So we can actually look at this about a month after birth, and we have a pretty good idea if this baby is going to be at risk for problems later on in life. It doesn't mean that every baby who has this problem will have problems later in life, but the risk is greatly increased. Now, if we treat the baby with choline, it responds to the, or its mother was treated with choline, it responds to the first sound and it has a diminished response to the second sound. And that's a more normal pattern. And we do see lots of babies who come out of pregnancies where we haven't intervened uh, who have this normal pattern, but they're much more likely to have it if their mothers have been on choline. And those infants who are treated with placebo, but whose mothers swore they ate a good diet, were much more likely to respond to the first sound and not inhibit the response to the second sound. You may notice the potentials are also a lot more rounded, uh, and so there are immaturities in other ways that we can detect within the evoked potential as well. So what we're doing is looking at an electrophysiological, a brainwave signature of what this baby's brain is going to function like. And if we move forward 20 or 30 years, this baby's brain may continue to look like this, and it may develop a psychosis, and if it looks like this, it's much more likely to be normal. Now, most people don't care a lot about what their babies of potentials look like, and they're difficult to record, but parents are very good at observing what their babies look like. And at 30 months of age, parents can reliably rate their children's behavior. And so we asked the children who were the parents of the children who were in our trial where we measured the brain waves now at 30 months to tell us how their ch children behaved. And they noticed improvements in two areas. One of them was social withdrawal. So these are babies who got prenatal choline 
They're now three to four years old. They're much less likely, the babies who got placebo, to be socially withdrawn. So they're able to play with their friends. They're not likely to sit in a corner by themselves and not interact with others. They're also less likely to have attention problems. They're better able to pay attention to what goes on around them and to concentrate. Now, the reason to look at 30 months of age is that not only can parents reliably relate their ch child's behavior, it's also very predictive of what the child will look like throughout childhood and early adulthood. Another research group asked parents of, ch of adults who had developed schizophrenia to tell us what they looked like at 30 months old. So here's Russell Crowe in The Beautiful Mind, uh, who has gotten chronically paranoid in the movie. And people with adult schizophrenia, when they were three to four years old, had lots of social withdrawal and lots of attention problems. So what we think we may have done at 30 months of age by intervening with choline before the baby was born is that we have moved back the needle of risk for these babies away from a pattern, should they have been vulnerable to it, of developing adult schizophrenia and towards a, a direction which is more normal. And we've done it simply by increasing one of the nutrients in the mother's diet. So let's go back and look at folic acid one more time. Is the dietary supplement of folic acid really needed? Or could you do it with good diet alone? With the folic acid, good diet and vitamins alone without folic acid did have an effect compared to no treatment whatsoever, but a relatively small effect. And if folic acid were added, even in the absence of a good diet, you got most of the effects of folic acid in terms of preventing cleft palate. And adding a good diet then was not harmful and certainly helped a little, but most of the effect came from the supplement. Given our experience in looking at women on placebo versus women on phosphatidylcholine supplements, we believe the same thing may be true with phosphatidylcholine as well. That a good diet and, of course, folic acid and multivitamins are all essential, but adding a extra dose of phosphatidylcholine may be really the key. Now, like folic acid, choline is effective only before birth. So this is not a treatment for the person who already has a mental illness. This is the treatment for someone who may carry some of that genetic risk who has yet to be born. And after birth, even in early childhood, it's already too late to give phosphatidylcholine. It's effective only before birth. Folic acid, in addition to preventing spina bifida, prevents cleft palate and even some cases of microencephaly. The alpha-7 nicotinic receptor and its gene are not limited to schizophrenia. We see abnormalities with them in bipolar disorder, autism, and ADHD. So choline it's, may have a similar broad effect on these illnesses, but of course it's in many ways too early to tell. But we notice that these early symptoms of attention deficit and social isolation, of course, are common to more than schizophrenia and represent a general risk for severe mental illness later. So what's our goal? Can we prevent all mental illness simply by giving people phosphatidylcholine before birth? I don't think so. But the goal is to prevent illnesses like schizophrenia, ADHD, autism, bipolar disorder at every step along the way. And our model here should really be heart disease. The American Heart Association and cardiologists have intervened to make sure that we have tertiary, secondary, and primary prevention for heart disease. So the entire population is told to have better diets, to exercise, 
and not to smoke. Those people who are beginning to develop signs of heart disease uh, are given statins, antihypertensives, and weight loss programs. And there's also an extensive program for those who've already had a heart attack or are having their first heart attack with automatic defibril defibrillators and stents. You might look at also the cost of these interventions. This is very expensive care. This is moderately expensive care, mostly for the drugs. This is very cheap to do. But this has to be delivered universally, this to people at risk, and this is reserved for people already having heart attacks. But what's the combined result? Deaths from heart disease have decreased significantly in the U.S. It's time to do the same thing for schizophrenia. So for the child waiting to be born, some day is now. It would be nice to wait for two or three decades and see how all this works out and maybe try it a couple of times, but that would be 40 to 80 years from now. And for a child who is about to be born, there's only one chance in life. And so we present this material to the public so that they can make the most informed decisions. If you want more information, there's a website, prenataldoctoradvice.com, and you can go there and get much more detailed information on what the research shows. And if you, you and your doctor decide that this is an intervention you'd like, if you're thinking about having a child or pregnant already, then there's advice for that as well. So thank you for tuning in. I understand we have people from all over the world, and we hope that this will be someday an intervention or something like it that will be helpful for the peoples of the world. Uh, Bob, thank you for a, a very clearly stated uh, presentation and really an explanation about how we can go from basic research to translational research to um, potentially significant method of prevention of illness. Um, so a first question is, um, does, during what period of pregnancy were, um, were the women given the supplement? The, these women in the clinical trial received it for their second and third trimesters. Now, that's primarily an artifact of the way research is done. We have to identify that people are pregnant, get their informed consent, do some preliminary screening. So far as we know from the animal model experiments, women can take this intervention before they decide to get pregnant. We give, we give it to the animals and our animal models before they're impregnated. So it's never too early to start. We also think it's never too late to start. But the ideal time probably is during the second trimester when the brain is really undergoing a great deal of, of development. Were there any side effects? Are there any potential concerns about um, taking the supplement during pregnancy for the women or for the, for the baby? Right. So the dose that we recommend is about twice the normal dietary dose, and it's far under what the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the National Academy of Medicine recommend as the upper level, level of safe uh, choline exposure. Remember that this is a food, so you are exposed to it all the time. We're simply increasing one of the nutrients in food. The potential side effects are primarily uh, to be gassy and sometimes a malodor, um, and that generally occurs in people who try to take choline supplements as opposed to phosphatidylcholine supplements. The mothers in our uh, study had no uh, serious side effects from the medication. And I, I just want to reiterate what you said very clearly. In this particular study, you, the controls were, you know, um, carefully given guidance to, to make sure that they had proper nutrition. And in the general population, there's a percentage of people who, who don't have that, and so the results would be even more um, emphatic 
if we if we looked at that population, obviously in a research study you want to make sure all of the mothers are getting the proper diet. Exactly, and and we saw a trend for the mothers who got placebo to be doing better in terms of their pregnancies than mothers in the general population. Okay. But the, um, adding the supplement still trumped uh, giving women good dietary advice. Right, right. That that was an added benefit. And um, you spoke about other conditions above and beyond schizophrenia. Could you tell us a little bit more about what other conditions might be prevented um, through this intervention? Sure. We don't know for sure, but we know that the developmental pathway we're looking at is one that's common to several illnesses. It's common to bipolar people who become psychotic, which is about a third of bipolar people. It's also a prominent developmental pathway in late appearing autism, and it's also a prominent developmental pathway in ADHD. So all those illnesses are potentially in play as being preventable or ameliorated by this particular intervention. The, now, I, I know that you are not in a position to give advice to an individual person, such as having met them. Um, what should people think about when this? Obviously, they would speak to their physician, but what, what would you recommend as a general rule a person's thought processes be about making a decision like this? Well, I think that with anything that's new, you have to uh, wonder about what's new, and um, I would feel more comfortable if it had been around for 20 or 30 years and we knew it worked. Um, you obviously want to check with your physicians, and we're uh, spending a lot of time making sure that physicians have the latest information on this intervention. Uh, then you want to begin to think about uh, that this may be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for your baby. I think it's a very uh, tough decision and women have to think a great deal about it. Uh, all we can do is present the facts and let each woman make up her own mind. But um, for myself, I think I would recommend it if the mother would ask what I would recommend. Okay, that's very helpful. And I guess that in particular for people who may have a family history of schizophrenia, um, that would perhaps add to the sort of weight on, on the side of um, trying this intervention? I think it would. I think, though, you have to remember that um, many cases of schizophrenia, the family history is remote or not obvious or not even known to the mother who's expecting. So, uh, again, universal uh, prevention in the end means that everyone uh, should feel encouraged or um, feel that the intervention is worthwhile and get it. Most of us don't have family histories of cleft palate, for example, or spina bifida, uh, which do run in families. But uh, all mothers routinely, without question, now take folic acid. Right. The, um, given the, the research that's been done, as it, uh, you have the 100 people in the study that you've described, are there other um, research protocols going on to further investigate this? Yes. Um, there are a number of people who have observed uh, women who uh, and measured their choline levels during pregnancy and almost all of them have found that women with higher choline levels during pregnancy uh, give rise to babies that are brighter. Uh, as late in life as seven years old, the effect can be detected. Um, they also give, uh, they're also able to overcome the effects of depression and maternal stress a bit better. Um, there's also been one negative trial. Uh, in that trial, uh, the women were very highly educated, and those who were told, and everyone was told to get dietary supplement to to eat the right diet 
it turned out the women on the placebo did an even better job of eating the right diet than, uh, than the women who actually received the choline. So um, their choline levels, or actually the levels of a metabolite, turned out to be higher than the women who were treated. But uh, no one has found an ill effect, and in general, the effects have been positive. The, now, you speak, and there's a couple of questions that are asking about the, the time frame to sort of have a better sense as to the results of the study, obviously waiting to see if what the ultimate results are for this group of um, babies who are now three to four years old. Um, it, is, is it your sense that you'll have um, some more indication as they reach their teenage years? You know, how are you monitoring it to see what the, what the results are over time to give the even stronger evidence even before they're 25 years old, let's say? So uh, this is a very small group, and we are currently undertaking a trial with a larger group. Uh, at the moment, this is not an intervention. The, the National Institute of Mental Health has said that this is an intervention that they will not fund more work on. And so we are relying, relying on private foundation, in particular the Institute for Children's Mental Disorder and the Anschutz Foundation to fund a second trial. And um, we also, through our website, have a way for women to tell us if they've taken choline or not. Uh, and so that we can follow their children. But all we can do is over the next 20 years or so accumulate the histories of as many women who've taken choline or not taken choline to see what happens to their babies. There never has been a research project which has successfully looked forward in time for 20 or 30 years. And of course, even if we're successful, it will be 20 or 30 years from now before we know the answer probably long after I'm gone. Um, that makes the decision of a woman today um, even more complicated. But unfortunately, that's just the fact of life of the human life cycle. It takes 20 or 30 years to be sure that a particular dose of choline, phosphatidylcholine, given to a woman during pregnancy will actually prevent her child from having a mental illness. The evidence looks good. We'll follow children all the way along through their development and, of course, report those results as they come in. But there's no way we can make the children grow any faster than they're growing. The, uh, so really, it is time will tell. On the other side of the, the time frame of this, you, you describe how the early work and, and the thinking behind developing this hypothesis and then developing this experimental approach. How long ago did you start that? What was the flow of your thinking to get to the point where you began um, this particular study uh, a couple of years ago looking at the effect of the choline supplement? It occurred because we were spending a lot of time looking at uh, new drugs that would affect alpha-7 nicotinic receptors in adulthood. And one morning, as I was thinking about where we had retrieved the alpha-7 nicotinic gene from, I realized we had retrieved it from a fetal brain library. In other words, a collection of DNAs that had come <laughs> from a fetal brain. And I asked our molecular biologist why did we use a fetal brain library to clone this receptor? And she said, well, it's obvious. There's much more activity of genes before birth than there is after birth. And then it struck me like a thunderbolt. We had been intervening in the wrong time of life to try to correct problems that are caused by deficits in the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor gene. By the time the baby is born, most of the ball game is over. Uh, if we're actually going to intervene, it would have to be done before birth. And we then began to get help from other people who had studied phosphatidylcholine because we realized that choline was what was activating the nicotinic receptors. We understood that from our work in trying to understand the receptor in animal models. And when we put all of that together, we realized 
that women can be choline deficient and that there were a number of investigators who were already suspecting that increasing maternal choline levels would have a very beneficial effect on fetal development. What we added is that it might also prevent mental illness. So this is something that people had already decided was good for babies, um, and uh, we thought it would also be specifically helpful for preventing the signs of mental illness. The um, it, very good explanation about the thought processes that that got there. Um, there's a, a question that that one of our uh, viewers are asking about. Um, is there information about uh, risk or greater risk in the children of vegetarian mothers who may have more difficulty getting the proper amount of choline in their diet? Right. So, of course, it depends on what kind of vegetarian and how strict the vegetarianism is. Um, one of the graduate students who helped us on this project uh, and I used to do an experiment together on one of our mouse models uh, every Tuesday morning. So she would get in early and she would do all the preparation and I would lecture to the medical students and then about 11 o'clock I would go by the uh, food store and I would buy her a pemmican bar because she was a vegetarian and I would buy myself a tuna fish sandwich and then we'd sit and eat and do the experiment. That's no longer allowed to eat in laboratories, but we used to do it. And one morning I came in with my tuna fish sandwich and her pemmican bar and she said, I don't want that. And she produced a giant roast beef sandwich. And she said, I'm pregnant and the baby is calling to me. Um, so women do uh, vary their diet, but I know that there are many women who do not. Uh, vegetarianism itself is not particularly known to be a risk factor for mental illness, but uh, when women are vegetarians, it's difficult to get enough phosphatidylcholine. It is rich in soybeans, and women who take soybean granules uh, can take enough, and we have recommendations for vegans on our website as to how to use soybean granules or to take uh, phosphatidylcholine containing capsules as a way of getting this nutrient that uh, is not present in most vegan diets. Uh, they may also want to check a few other things that sometimes it's difficult to get in a, a vegan diet such as iron, which the baby will also need uh, some extra help with. But uh, we don't think that there's anything that uh, makes this intervention incompatible with being a vegan. And I should add that uh, all of the uh, phosphatidylcholine that is actually sold as supplements is vegan uh, because it comes from soybeans. You simply can't eat enough soybeans to give yourself enough phosphatidylcholine every day but um, when you're pregnant, but uh, enough can be extracted from them by relatively safe means to get uh, enough phosphatidylcholine to be given as a supplement. Uh, um, are there any other uh, areas that you're looking at similar to the choline um, as uh, additional uh, potential um, interventions for prevention? Sure. Uh, choline, uh, phosphatidylcholine is not something that prevents all aspects of maternal risk uh, for mental illness in the offspring. And one of the reasons we want people to check with their own doctors is to make sure that they don't make that mistake. So uh, we recommend a number of things to pregnant women which are effective in, we think, which will prove to be effective in decreasing mental illness later in life. Those include a good multivitamin preparation in addition to the folic acid supplement. Those usually come together as one tablet. Um, the mother needs to have her iron checked and make sure that she's not developing diabetes, uh, which can occur during gestation. Those are also risks for mental illness. We ask that all mothers stop smoking uh, and stop all drug use. That's critical. And it's also critical that mothers protect themselves against infection. 
So one of the things that a mother certainly can do uh, and should do is to have a flu shot early in the season to protect herself against the flu. When the mother gets the flu, the baby doesn't get infected, but the mother begins a reaction to the flu, uh, which she can feel is that icky feeling you get when you're about to come down with the flu. Unfortunately, the cytokines or chemicals released during that uh, time also attack the placenta uh, and attack thereby deprive the baby of nutrition. And so a lot of that can be prevented with good uh, hand washing and also flu shots. The all very, very good advice. That being said, if there's a pregnant person listening who gets the flu, they should consult with their doctor and you know take whatever steps their doctor recommends at this point, post opportunity to take a shot. Right. Um, the uh, and how about the issue of exercise? Have you seen anything exercise of the pregnant mother? Anything along those lines? The uh, pregnancy is, a, of course, a stress on the human body, and if women exercise uh, and keep up their cardiovascular function, um, all that blood is getting pumped to the baby, and so that's very important. I think the other preventative that we haven't talked about, which we believe is also important, is that if the mother should become depressed or anxious, we have looked in our studies at the effects of having the mother treated or untreated for mental illness. In our studies, if we recognize that a mother is mentally ill in the course of the study, uh, we recommend that she gets treatment. But of course, those are her choices, and women may choose one way or the other. And uh, those women who choose to get treated, including taking medication, their babies generally look much better at birth than those women who choose not to get treated. So we recommend that any woman who gets depressed or anxious during pregnancy, and obstetricians are now screening for that, make sure she get treatment right away. Very good advice, and obviously um, doing everything to support the mother um, is, is crucial, ultimately, for, for the baby. Most psychiatrists don't treat fetuses, but I guess I do, and uh, my colleagues do as well. Um, and we believe that um, this may be the easiest, simplest, and in the long run, most effective way to really do our bit to prevent mental illness. Well, it's certainly the, the work that you have done holds such tremendous promise, and I want to thank you for, uh, for all the work you've done and for sharing that with us. And, um, and I also want to say um, I, I, I know you take good care of yourself and hope you continue to do so so that you are actually around when we get the results. Uh, so um, I know you put the 20 to 30 years, but we, we want you to continue to be here and active um, down the down the road at that point. Uh, so, uh, so Bob, thank you very very much for all that you do um, and for taking the time with us um, today. I also want to thank everybody for joining us um, on this webinar. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. And if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit our webinar page um, at our website. Finally, I would hope that people will join us again next month when Dr. Yvette Shalin, Professor of Psychiatry and Radiology and Director of the Center for Neuroscience of Depression and Stress, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, a member of our scientific council as well, when she will present a webinar on neuroinflammatory hypothesis of depression. This will take place on Tuesday, December 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.